Uh, it gives me great pleasure to bring on board our consulting editor, Swami Nathan Ankleshwar here. Swami, good morning. Thank you for joining us. I know these are VRs for you and you've yes. stayed uh, up for this. So really appreciate that. All right. What yes. should we expect? Rather, rather, me, rather than me throwing at a straightforward question at you, let's understand your th first thoughts on the big picture. On the budget. Okay. As far as I am concerned, there are various people talking about a fiscal stimulus reviving the economy. To my mind, the biggest possible stimulus is to have as many people vaccinated as possible in as short a time. That will do more for the economy than anything else. Any talking about stock markets, any tax break, none of that can remotely compare with doing a vaccination rollout very fast. Why? Why? Because the greatest depressing factor in the economy today is fear. There is fear of going out, fear of going for entertainment, fear for going for a shopping mall, fear for going on a pilgrimage, fear for going for a visit. So the services sector, which is more than 50% of the economy, remains depressed, even though industry and agriculture are catching up. Services more than half the economy. It cannot be stimulated with tax breaks. It cannot be stimulated with uh, the normal financial things. The only way to stimulate it is to say so many people have been vaccinated and others have immunity already that we can now say we have herd immunity. And from now onwards, the transmission of COVID is no stronger than influenza or something else. So please resume your normal activities. Please renew, resume going to cinema halls, going to theaters, going to travel, resume all the normal services. That is the biggest possible boost the economy should get. So the focus should be on a very fast, quick rollout, get all the money out to the state government, to the district level, to the each supplier, cut out the red tape, make sure that the financial flows are flow. So I said, best, best stimulus, most important part, is a successful vaccination rollout. That is more important than all the things put together. Uh, that is my, would be my number one point. Number two, I would say that in terms of fiscal stimulus, you can reduce it. But you will have to make massive provisions first for this vaccination rollout. Uh, so that vaccination should be free for everybody and all the other guys on the logistical chain must be reimbursed. Secondly, we have to face up that the twin balance sheet crisis, uh, just as the 2008-9 crisis, created this twin balance sheet problem that the companies are bust and therefore they're making the lenders bust. It is going to return with doubled strength this year. Once that, you know, all these moratoriums, the RBI end, what are we going to do about huge bad debts of corporations, which in turn will then reflect on the balance sheets of the banks? So I think you need to have a very large provision, maybe as much as 100,000 crores, even in just one year to recapitalize the banks announce what is the truth about the bank, banking system, and get lending to start again. What RBA so far has done is let us pretend. Let us have a moratorium. Let us, uh, for the time saying by, you know, don't put everything on the books. The provisioning is very, very incomplete. You need to do the provisioning, and we need to have massive recapitalization. So these are the two things I would focus on in the budget. Uh, beyond that, I would say you keep your direct taxes stable. Please don't change them. Uh, I would only say, please go easy on protectionism. There will be a huge demand from these sectors getting uh, production linked incentive that you please also give me 20% import protection. If you do that, I think we are going in the wrong direction, especially some of the new sectors are things like textiles. I mean, these are not infant industries. Uh, and I don't think you're going to as attract massive foreign investment. So to just give massive protection is the wrong direction. So I said, PLI is already there. That is enough incentive. Please don't add to it by making India a highly protectionist economy because the first lesson of economics is ultimately a tax on imports becomes a tax on exports. A country cannot have very large amount of protection in terms of incoming and yet be competitive in the exports. So these would be my main ideas. Great point. Let's address the advantage the tailwind we have the tailwind which we have and that's a natural global tailwind one is low interest rates and second is abundant liquidity which really wants to come into india how can they take advantage of something which is unusual and something which has not happened in the past before listen 
there is no point saying that there is availability of funds if there is no demand for the funds. So on the one hand, you must have be if this production linked incentive scheme is aimed to attract funds into investment. I do not know if it happens, but if it does happen, it will be a good thing. Over and above that, the government needs to get cracking with its privatization program. Uh, if you can start privatizing one PSU every month in the coming year, now that stock market, that would be another way of absorbing the foreign flows. But beyond that, you see, as far as greenfield investment is concerned, these things take time. It doesn't happen overnight. It can't happen in one financial year. So you have to focus on what's already going on. What's already going on, uh, maybe you can attract these foreign companies a little more onto the asset reconstruction, uh, have a very massive sale of de bad debts at attractive prices. Maybe that's one way of quickly absorbing funds and getting somebody else to work. So as I said, over and above that, the government, if it feels like having massive borrowing in order to take advantage of the low interest rates for infrastructure, well and good. Uh, if the public sector undertakings, whatever projects are ongoing, brownfield expansions and delayed things, repairs, maintenance, all of these can absorb money quickly. So if the government wants to go on a borrowing program, frankly, the low interest, the fact that the money is coming in is already helping to depress interest rates in India. So the effect is already there. There is no need for the Indian government to borrow from a broad where our foreign exchange reserve is so high. So the, 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 I don't think the game is borrowing from abroad, but wherever the flows are there, harness them for your existing programs as quickly and smoothly as possible with as little red tape as possible. Whether we like it or we don't like it, every time before budget, the super rich, they get scared. Sometimes because of a tax and assess. This time there is a reason that we government needs uh, a COVID cess. It may not generate a lot of revenue, but a COVID cess or something on those lines could dampen the sentiment further. A COVID cess would be a mistake. Because a COVID cess would be, say, at a time that you are saying you want to stimulate the economy. Is that the right time to be putting a tax which will then reduce demand? This is not the right time to be doing that. Uh, I would say our income tax rates are already very high compared with our neighbors in the ASEAN and countries. So on corporate tax, you have reduced your rate. You have brought, now brought it down to 15% for companies that don't want additional tax breaks. Then I'm afraid on income tax, we are already very high compared with our neighbors. So the idea of putting a cess on top of COVID, in, uh, on top of income tax, in my view, would be a bad mistake. Just go ahead and borrow. Let the fiscal deficit be a little higher for two reasons, because there are going to be two big one-time expenses this year. One is going to be bank recapitalization, if you follow my formula. The second is going to be the COVID rollout, which will also be very expensive, maybe 100,000 crores. So just have an additional deficit financing for one year. These two will automatically go disappear next year. So they are, so to speak, they have a sunset clause. They are self-ending. So I would say instead of trying to raise more money, be a little easier on the fiscal deficit for the current financial year, because automatically the next year it's going to come down. Sure. Swami, many believe that there is very little uh, elbow room to actually cut in, uh, you know, income tax rates. But that aside, you know, we all know that the government's priority should be this time around the vaccine rollout, healthcare spends and infrastructure, which has been crying, uh, crying need for many, many decades now. What do you think the government is going to spend on? What's going to be their priority when it comes to spending? I think the, the priority, as I said, one thing about the budget is it's a political document. So Nimla Sita Raman will have a two hour, three hour speech saying, I'm giving one thing for every single lobby in the country from A to Z, from East to West, from North to South, every single lobby, some little amount will be provided. Okay, that is politics. That is the way it will be done. Uh, certainly for the farmers, for farmers' agitation, something will be provided. That's politics. But the large-scale spending, where can you step it up? On infrastructure, you have already been pushing. There are many projects which are already ready, or else there are other programs where you can quickly spend on repairs and maintenance. 
On new projects, you cannot spend money quickly. The tendering and other procedures take time. But maintenance and other things, you can spend very, very quickly. So I think the priorities would be the, 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 COVID, the COVID attack. We have to vaccinate everybody. Then I think with that, you have to have a publicity blitz. We have to have a huge communications campaign. You have to tell people, look, 70% people either have vaccinated or already have immunity. Now, this is no more dangerous than influenza. So please go out and spend money as normal, go to shopping malls, go to theaters, go on pilgrimages, go on holidays. Uh, the, you, have to re, you have to have a huge campaign on reviving confidence. Uh, so as I said, attacking COVID and the infrastructure, number three has to be the recapitalization of the banks on a massive scale. These have to be the three big priorities. Sure. Swami, what could the budget have for capital markets? Because much unlike the economy, the capital markets have been on a roll, you know, be it in terms of the prices that we're currently at, or for that matter, the kind of deluge of FII money which has been pouring into the markets on a daily basis. So as I said, when things are going well, why do anything? You don't, you do not need to reduce this flow. You do not need to do any tax brace or anything to increase the flow. It would be a bad idea to somehow try to tax the inflows. So I said, that is a positive. That is a tailwind for us. So just say that this is a good situation and we want it to continue. We should not have a government that's constantly trying to tinker with every tax and every sector. You say, this is one area where things are going okay. I am not going to do anything further for the current year. Whatever is happening, let it continue. Okay. <clears throat> Swami, how would you, um, you know, look at the kind of growth that we have seen, you know, now that we've started to get a sense of where we're at post a very difficult year and, uh, you know, what we can anticipate now going forward? Does it seem as dire as was originally anticipated? I would say that I have been very impressed by the speed of the recovery in the last quarter. Uh, and it seems to me when I look at the figures on uh, the PMIs of uh, manufacturing, when I look at what's happening overall from various sectors, we have proved our resilience. The economy is not in such as bad shape as I had originally expected. So I think GDP in the current year may be no more than minus 6 to 7% against minus 10% or even 14% as some people are predicting. Well, maybe. So let's say minus 7, 6 or 7. In the coming year, if the world as a whole recovers from COVID, now this is not guaranteed because there is a second COVID upsurge in the West uh, and in Japan. So, you know, I hope that will soon be taken care of. Vaccinations are beginning. Let's hope within three to six months that particular thing gets out. If the world economy rebounds, then given our resilience, given the positive things, I will not be surprised if India has record GDP growth of 10 to 12% in the coming year. So that itself will give a big boost to revenues. Uh, it will bring down the fiscal deficit. Uh, it will make things easier for every branch of finance if we have this very, very fast rate of industrial growth. So I think if uh, things go okay, we can look forward to very fast GDP growth in the year ahead. The question is what happens after that? Then we still need these basic reforms that make us competitive. We are uncompetitive in, in land acquisition, in the cost of land and the cost of money. Our labor reforms, if you ask me, are not deep enough, are not wide enough. Uh, we still have a problem that electricity rates are too high for industry. Uh, freight rates are too high because we are using these high rates to subsidize passengers in the case of railways and farmers in the case of agriculture. So we need to get rid of some of these distortions and become more competitive for the year beyond. And I hope, therefore, the budget also has some kind of ideas of a long-term nature of what should happen over the next five years. So that re those reforms need to be announced now itself, and a start should be made in a phased manner. Okay. Swami, for a minute and last question, let me just be an optimist here. And the optimist in me is saying, Agri is back, interest rates are low, services comes back next year and the sentiment because of the COVID vaccine will definitely be better than what we saw in last six months. Are we in for a 
big surprise on the economy, on the earnings. Because you know, these things, they work like animal spirits. When things come back, they come back with a vengeance. So I have no doubt, as I said, if you are going to have 10 to 12% GDP growth, as I'm saying, I'm being as optimistic or more optimistic than you. As against that, we are going to have massive provision for NPAs. As I said, the twin balance sheet problem is going to be twice as bad this time as it was in the 2000, in the last Great Recession of 2008 to 9. So on the one hand, GDP is going to make a big rebound, I think, which is positive. But you must make sure that the financial sector, which has really been scarred very deeply by this crisis, is also enabled to participate in that boom. So that is the only caveat. I am an optimist, but if go, earnings go back, will go up. But if you tell the truth about the balance sheets, I'm afraid there are huge, huge bad debts coming up. To that extent, the financial sector may not be looking pretty at all in the year to come. And uh, always a delight and a pleasure to hear your thoughts.